watching NRA TV with Bill Whittle. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Hot Mike Show uh, live from Los Angeles. I'm Bill Whittle, and uh, Hot Mike took a long walk on a short pier, so they're trying to dry him off. He's being four or five blow dryers at work on him now in the in the Berry uh, dressing room, so with any luck, we'll have him back for the second half of the show today. Uh, so, hey, speaking of peers, uh, today I'd like to talk about these people that seem to be kind of our tour guides on the road to oblivion. I'm utterly convinced that when Western civilization ends, if it ends, it's not going to end on my watch, I can tell you that much, and yours either. But if it ends, I'm sure it's going to be announced by, a, by, a, by the BBC. And the, the last voice that we're going to hear is going to be one of these very tony British voices, very cultured, you know, advising us on why everything had to go down and what awful people we are and how anyone with any sense of, you know, style or, or um, any sense of sensitivity at all, really, would just understand completely that Western civilization just deserved to die. And one of the people that are like that is, uh, is a guy named Piers Morgan. Piers Morgan is a perfect example of, of these kind of insulated, vain, uneducated people. They live in isolation, you know, they're, they're free from the consequences of their beliefs, which they not only hold, but which they have to impose upon everybody else. It's one thing to be a, you know, a, a, a middle-minded British twit yourself, but that doesn't mean you have to force everybody else down to that level. Now, uh, Piers is known for the occasional uh, tweet, and uh, we got one from him today. And this is the kind of deep thinking that I want to talk about, because these are the people, don't forget now, these are the people who are our moral superiors, and not just our moral superiors, they're our moral and intellectual superiors. And these are the people that determine what to think and how. Piers Morgan uh, tweeted, both the First and Second Amendments should be amended again, in my humble opinion, to ban Nazis and reduce gun deaths. Well, let's get started on that, shall we? Uh, here's the first thing, uh, Piers. The amendments don't need to be amended again. The amendments aren't amended. The amendments are amendment to the Constitution. You're talking about amending the Constitution again. The amendments don't get amended. Just a little thing, but it's, you know, kind of thing that people lose points for on style. Pierce then goes on to say, start this tweet with, uh, in my humble opinion, please, please, Pierce, honestly, you know, this, this Constitution's had 228 years of history. It was put together by the greatest minds that ever walked this planet in a, in a group of them together that has never been seen before and I don't think ever will be seen again in the history of the human race. Uh, these people, the Founding Fathers, spent lifetime, a lifetime, they just get together for, for a couple weeks to throw this thing together. They had spent a lifetime studying government, studying people, studying tyranny, studying stupidity, studying laziness, studying hard work, all of it. And they all brought all of these different experiences together and they managed to grasp a document that found a way to leave people alone without letting idiots like Pierce Morgan screw it up. That's quite an achievement. And it's a lot more of an intellectual achievement than First and Second Amendment should be amended again, in my humble opinion, to ban Nazis and reduce gun uh, deaths. So let's explore just a little bit um, the, the moral character and the deep philosophical base of Pierce Morgan, who feels that it's his obligation as an incredibly refined member of the news media to inform us uh, knuckle-dragging savages out here in flyover country just exactly how we should be taking our freedom. So let's just talk a little bit about Piers before we get to our guest today. Piers Morgan got started as a, a tabloid editor in the United Kingdom. He was the editor of the Daily Mirror during the phone hacking scandal. And that's when people at the newspaper were illegally wiretapping celebrities, they were wiretapping the royal family, all of it illegal in order to get these tabloid stories. He was the editor there. Um, and. Uh, actually, I'm not sure he was the editor there. He was there at the Daily Mail. In any event, not only did they tap the family, uh, the phones of the royal family, they managed to find photos of a girl who was murdered, a young school girl who was murdered, and they managed to get photos of um, British war dead families coming home, you know, and, and, and photos of bomb victims. This kind of, this kind of bottom dwelling slime. Pierce was, uh, was basically brought before a committee about this, and, and he said, 
This is um, what Pierce said. He said, Morgan denied ever having backed a phone or, quote, to my knowledge, published any story obtained from the hacking of a phone, unquote. This was in front of the Levinson Committee, and Chairman Levinson went on to say that Morgan's testimony about phone hacking was utterly unpersuasive and clearly proves that he was aware that it was taking place in the press as a whole and that he was sufficiently unembarrassed by what was criminal behavior that he was prepared to joke about it. So, point number one, Piers Morgan is a dirtbag and he's a liar. He did these ridiculous, low, illegal things to sell newspapers and ruin people's lives, and then he lied about it. So there's that to begin with. Uh, number two, uh, Piers has not had what we would call a stellar trajectory uh, lately. 2011, he came to CNN, the home of fake news, and from 2011 to 2014, he was host of Piers uh, Pierce Morgan Live, uh, which replaced uh, Larry King Live, but he pretty much tanked the ratings on that show. And during the show, the run of his show, the four years of his show, we got a chance to see his utter, utter misunderstanding of this country, constitution, everything we believe in, and not just his misunderstanding of it, but his contempt for it as well. Now, this person who's going to um, opine on uh, the quality of the First and Second Amendment also was a judge on America's Got Talent and Britain's Got Talent. And he was, in fact, uh, in 2008, he won the seventh season of Celebrity Apprentice. So you can see that his qualifications to, to basically comment on something as important as the First and Second Amendment are, are really pretty unparalleled. And one final thing about uh, our friend Piers Morgan, ladies and gentlemen. Piers has written eight books so far. He's 52 years old. He's written eight books. Four are memoirs. Four. Four books at 52 about himself. This is the kind of narcissism that we're going to get to in a minute. So we have a guest joining us today, uh, Jan Morgan of janmorganmedia.com. Uh, she's on the phone. We couldn't get the video uh, link. Uh, she's in an undisclosed location where she should be having a good time, apparently. Uh, but she's a Second Amendment defender and a, and a big advocate for freedom. So, uh, Jan, I, I guess you're out there. Can you hear me? Yes, Bill. Great to join you today. And I just want to clarify right off the top that, that because Piers has the same last name that I do. I am not in any way related to that man, ever. You just so. ran away with you re, just ran away with my first joke of the day. So no sorry, relation. Sorry, but yeah. And the other thing is, I'm, no I'm relation. He out, based based on the fact that this guy has continuously bashed the, the the Constitution and the Bill of Rights, the very foundation that this nation was built upon, makes me wonder why anybody even considers anything he says relevant anymore. I, I, I don't even know why we give him the time of day uh, other than he's out there and I guess a few people are listening. Well, you know, let's just go down that road for a second, Jen, because that's an interesting, it's a little side street, but it's a very interesting one. Um, Piers Morgan is in the same category of people as Kathy Griffith and, and all the rest of these, you know, D-list celebrities that are looking for attention by making a tweet that's, you know, kind of outrageous. And, and you make an interesting point that people have said, why give them the attention? Why, um, you know, why, why even bring it up? Nobody's listening to them. But there's something actually really interesting going on out there. I think, Jen, I'd like to get your take on this, okay. especially since the inauguration of Donald Trump. I am seeing in comment sections on YouTube, Facebook, all of these social media, you would look at any kind of a conservative video or a liberal video, and on YouTube, the comments would be 90, 10, 95, 5, heavily, heavily, heavily in favor of the left. Now it's about 50, 50. People are coming out and defending Donald Trump in these anonymous comment sections. They're, he's being defended everywhere. People that criticize him and these social justice warriors are being mocked openly by their mm -hmm. peers and um pardon the phrase and i think <laughs> that what has happened is by fighting back we have given an uh, we have given encouragement to the n huge number of people out there who have felt the way that we do and simply have been bullied into silence by the intimidation of the uh of the violent left that is true i do agree with you on that and i i think People from Pierre's corner of the world also, Bill, I know for a fact, there are pockets of people there who want their gun rights back because they've seen, and especially with the number of, of uh, refugees that have come into their company and the into their country and the mayhem that has ensued, 
uh, where disarmed citizens are suddenly very vulnerable uh, to attacks by, by people who, have a, who come from a different culture entirely and will not assimilate. I think people there, I know because I've trained some of them, they come to America on vacation and for some reason, they end up at my gun range. I've, I've trained, Bill, people from nine different countries and every state in America in my firearms training program. A wow. police officer from the, from the U.K., as a matter of fact, came here. And, and even though uh, people from that corner of the world are um, very sensitive to firearms because they've been without them for so long, they are beginning to see it is their only way to defend innocent life there. Now, they are far removed from the whole Constitutional Bill of Rights thing that, you know, and, and, and the, the ability to understand that our Second Amendment isn't about self-defense. Originally, it, it was about, and it's still about, to most of us who really understand it, it's about uh, keeping tyranny at bay. And peers, see, the so, very thing so you he must... talked about in his... On his Twitter feed, the very thing I, he I was just going to say, Jim, to eliminate the First Amendment. The Second Amendment is how we keep people like peers and people who don't understand the true meaning of the Second Amendment from from removing the remaining Bill of Rights. The Second Amendment is all we have to keep uh, the absolutely remaining Bill of Rights. So, no, absolutely you know, right, and uh, I would I would imagine that um, on that gun range, uh, you must get a chance to see these people, as you say, many of them never had any experience with firearms before, they're Europeans or whatever. Uh, you must have a, a, an opportunity to see people's faces just kind of light up. It's not, it's a strange look. I've seen it many times on a gun range with people who've never fired a gun before. It's it's not right. this kind of what the left would accuse us of. It's not this kind of intoxicated woohoo, let's start blowing rounds off into the ceiling. It's this kind of a quiet awareness of the fact that they are now capable of defending themselves, that, that the whole world has changed for them. It is amazing. And I can tell you, I had a, a police officer from the UK come here. They were in America on vacation, and he said, we have to visit the gun cave. And he ended up signing up for my class. And even though he is a police officer in the UK, and he served in the military there, and by the way, he was already an amazing shot. But his wife was here on vacation with him, and she ended up taking the class with him. And she was totally... Uh, sensitive to being around firearms at all. And she was fascinated with the fact that I walk around this range with a loaded chambered firearm in my belt and a, and a holster. Uh, and, and yes, they are, they've been without firearms for so long that, that there's a whole um, awareness that is raised once they see that it's not like the Wild West here in America, that all kinds of people, law-abiding citizens, get, you know, carry guns and are armed and trained. And one of the things that I teach in my classes always is that we don't have guns to kill people, that guns save lives. And see, it's the, the whole narrative that they've been fed for decades, which has brainwashed so many people, is that guns kill people. And the media fails to tell yep. them that over 2 million times each year in America, law-abiding citizens pull guns and save lives. And in many instances, the triggers yeah, that little Yeah, that gun. little fact gets left out a lot, I've noticed. Um, you know... Uh, that is that is really a, a it's a profound insight because you can tell on people's faces you can see the moment uh, where they where they change. But let's um, let's do this, Jen. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, uh, you can help me um, deconstruct that little tweet of his bit by bit and kind of show it for the kind of nonsense that it really is. I'm Bill Little. This is the Hot Mike Show. We'll be right back. It's hard to believe, but this year marks the sixth season of The Noir Show. I've had a hell of a good time trying to put together the best take on gun culture I possibly can. And one of the best parts has been interacting with you, the fans. One thing you've said from the very beginning is we want more noir. Well, me too. So this year I'm doing things a little different. We're gonna wait until the fall to give you finished, polished, shiny new episodes. Nope, this year we're gonna release content while we're still in production. So some of these videos are going to make it into the final episodes this fall. Others are only going to be standalone. Either way, my goal is to give you exactly what you want. More noir. So look forward to all sorts of new content from The Noir Show for the rest of the year. And I hope you enjoy. It's as patriotic as it gets. A gathering in the heartland of folks from all 50 states. Welders, salesmen, farmers, accountants, soldiers, first responders. Here, we're all the same. Here, we are all race fans. 
We are proud of our country, proud of our military, proud of our drivers. We proudly stand for our national anthem, and we have a great reverence for names like Yarborough, Earnhardt, Waltrip, and Gordon. Yes, there are other NASCAR races, but this one is special. 500 temper flaring, finger waving, ego busting 15 second laps. And deep into the warm August night, hardly a seat in the last great Coliseum will be used. You see, this isn't just a race. This is America's night race. The Bass Pro Shops NRA night race. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to the Hot Mike Show. I'm Bill Whittle, and we're talking about narcissistic idiot Piers Morgan and his uh, tweet uh, where he basically says we need to amend the amendments, reamend them, he says, the First and Second Amendments. And we have, of course, a very high reason for doing that. And the reason is to ban Nazis and to reduce gun deaths. Now, with us on the phone is uh, Freedom's friend uh, Jan Morgan. Same last name as Pierce, but that's no reason to be mean, folks. Um, Jan is uh, at her shooting range right now, and, and so if you hear concussive noises during the rest of the show, just think of them as little exclamation marks of freedom. Uh, so we covered in the beginning um, Piers' amendment thing, and, and we covered uh, in his humble opinion and all the rest of it. Um, you know, Jan, quickly, because this is ground that we've all tread here pretty pretty well, I would say, what would you say to, to, to peers in terms of actual evidence when he says banning guns, uh, what does he say, reduce gun deaths because you're going to break down the Second Amendment? It seems to me that gun bans are strictly enforced in places like Chicago and the murder rate is insane and places like, oh, I don't know, Plano, Texas or Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, every single person's got probably 20 firearms in their house, and those areas seem to be relatively murder-free. What would you say to Piers' idea about that? Well, I would say that it, let's skip even current events and let's look at history and that Piers needs to get a history lesson because in the 20th century, over 170 million people have been annihilated by their own governments after being disarmed. So That's right that disarming the citizenry eventually can lead to annihilation. History has proven that. And if you don't know your history, you are doomed to repeat it. You've got, you know, and, and in every case, Bill, of course, you and I know this, but in every single case, it always began with the, the little steps that, like Piers is suggesting, more regulations, uh, gun registry. Piers would be perfectly comfortable with a gun registry. Well, in the process, of annihilation that has occurred in the 20th century. In every case, the process was the same. Started with gun registration of firearms. Registration of firearms eventually always led to confiscation of firearms, which eventually always led to annihilation. Now, no, I don't expect that's going to happen in America. And the reason it's not is because the citizens of this country understand history and we have our Second Amendment and we're not going to continue uh, to allow our government to regulate. In fact, if you know me, Bill, you know that I am constantly fighting to not just hold the line. It seems like in spite of all the NRA's great efforts, uh, we're still just holding the line. It's like everything we can do to stop these constant infringements. I would like for us to move beyond that and actually push past the line and start repealing and peeling away some of the 20-plus thousand gun control laws in the books in this country. That's my goal. So Piers is, you know, I, I would love a chance to debate the guy. I, I, I really would. He, he is absolutely yeah, I don't think world, world history. I don't think that's something he would I don't think that's something he would enjoy too much. And by the way, it is just so absolutely epic to hear you talking about uh, gun rights and Second Amendment rights and just hearing uh, just hearing gunshots going off in the distance. Just just kind of <laughs> kind of cool. Um, so, look, here's the thing. Um, we, we know that the gun control banning gun control thing and, and that we, we, we've been up and down this road. But the one thing I think that's interesting is here's a guy who's a journalist who's calling for 
the First Amendment as well to be amended, to be restricted. And basically what he's saying is we ought to amend the First Amendment so that we can ban Nazis. Now, <laughs> Jan, I've looked a little bit at history, and I've seen the attempts to ban um, uh, alcohol. Uh, we've tried to ban the war on drugs. They've tried to ban prostitution. They've tried to ban a lot of things. They don't seem to be terribly successful. But look, here's the thing about the banning Nazis things, right? Jan, I think that, uh, I think Piers Morgan has totalitarian, authoritarian <laughs> instincts. I think he's, I think he's in favor of a very powerful centralized government, and therefore I think he's a dangerous collectivist, and therefore Piers Morgan is pretty clearly a Nazi, and therefore Piers Morgan needs to be banned from, uh, from television and radio. Absolutely agree, but I would, I would say he doesn't just have instincts. I think that Piers Morgan has totalitarian wet dreams every night. I'm sorry, and that may not be appropriate yeah. for uh, this time of day TV, but I, that's, that's where he is. And, you know, he brought this whole thing up again, ironically, uh, after the situation uh, that we had this weekend, the horrible uh, tragedy that we had. And, and he attacked gun rights again. And here, in that situation, there were no firearms-related deaths or injuries. None. None. No. And in fact, there was, no, uh, there was just a well-armed nature. militia present. There was a well-armed militia present there, and there still there were no there were no guns drawn on people. There were no no one no one was shot accidentally or on purpose. So the, to him bringing the whole gun rights uh, debate back to the forefront over what happened this weekend is also just out of place and and typical and. Uh, you know the guy. I, I don't know how he, how he has any credibility left anymore at all. But I'm ready to, to just stomp it in the ground and let's end his, his gun, uh, gun control uh, rants once and for all. Yeah. Jan, you and know, uh, th I, I, this... Uh, no, look, look, let me just pick it up here. Um, this... Uh, this story that I'm about to tell you very briefly is the first time I can ever remember. I was very young. I was probably six or seven years old. It's the first time I ever remember thinking, this is an adult thought that I'm about that I'm having here. This is something important. And what was happening was um, my dad had gotten to uh, Europe in the last week of World War II. He never saw combat or anything. But we grew up on shows like Combat and, and you know, all of this, all of this World War II stuff. And and my father went to fight the Nazis. I hate the damn Nazis. He hated them, too. So right. you can imagine my surprise when I was seven years old or eight or something like that. And the news reports were that the Nazis were marching in Skokie, Illinois, that they that they petitioned to march down the streets of that city and that they'd won their legal battle to do so. And that the, the Nazis and the swastika were, were, were just waving down the street in small town America. And I thought my dad was gonna say, well, we need to absolutely get the tanks out and just crush these people, put them away, lock them up. He said, no, Billy, we gotta, you, you gotta let them do it. And I was flabbergasted. I was just uh -huh. gobsmacked. I said, why, right. why? He said, because who decides? Who decides what's legal and not? Who decides what's hate speech and not? Who decides, who decides? Uh -huh. If you have one person deciding what can be said and not said, then it's over. You have to allow these repugnant, repulsive things to come. That's the price of free speech, the price of being able to speak your mind and think what you want to think. The, that is not free. It's a freedom, but it's not free. That freedom costs us in terms of hearing either incredibly bigoted, incredibly stupid, incredibly vile, uh, incredibly indecent, pornographic, whatever. All of these viewpoints come with this freedom, and that's, that's the price tag. Yes. And when I say, though, that I want these rants to end once and for all, I don't mean squashing his free speech. What I mean is of course not. that enough people, enough people in the world will see the truth. As Dana Lash held her fist up and said, the clenched fists of truth, and we have the facts on our side. And eventually, as more people die as a result of violence because they are not armed and don't have a way to defend themselves, I think you're going to see more people moving over to our side. I know that we have had record numbers of people. The more the government tries to control gun rights, the more people are in fearful of losing those rights, and they're getting armed and trained. That's what Obama did <laughs> for America, and I'm grateful to that. The more he tried to talk about gun control, the more American citizens started saying, you know what, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my gun rights. I'm going to get armed and trained. So when people like Pierce talk 
and then we can stand up to him with facts and they see the truth. I think you're, you, we are going to see, and we can thank Pierce for that, more people are going to come to the realization that an armed America is a free America. Most armed, most free, always. Yep. Um, so there you have it, ladies and gentlemen, a Second Amendment advocate with uh, gunshots in the background to prove it, making a very uh, cogent and sensible defense of the First Amendment. Thank you so much for joining us, Jan. You can find her at janmorganmedia.com. Uh, it's a pleasure having you here today. I just want to wrap with a, with a very quick thought here. Um, there is a philosopher, and he was kind of a loathsome guy, but nevertheless, I think he made a really interesting point. Uh, a, a guy was a a real Marxist, uh, part of the Frankfurt School. His name's Eric Fromm. He was a psychologist. And Eric Fromm wrote a book called Escape from Freedom. Not Escape to Freedom, Escape from Freedom. And his basic premise was, after years of study, and, and I think this has been backed up many times, he found out that most people, if left alone, if, if you basically took away their, their societal you know, support structures, if you just got people alone and asked them, he said, most people don't really want to be free. Most people, if you gave them a choice, would you rather be free or would you rather have security? Would you like to be able to live anywhere you want to or would you like to have guaranteed rent for the rest of your life? These kind of questions. Fromm was the first person to really state that many people, most people in, in the world, certainly, I don't think in this country, but most people are afraid of freedom. Freedom is not easy. Freedom's not easy at all. Freedom is hard work, and it's scary. It's scary to not know where the next uh, rent check is going to come from when you're tight on money. It's scary. And it's, it's work, too, you know, doing your laundry and, and, and all of these other things that you have to do on a daily basis. Your responsibility. It's, you're an adult. It's not being done by somebody else. But, you know, people that would trade their security, that would trade their liberty, rather, in exchange for uh, security, as, as Franklin said, deserve neither liberty or security. And people who have no personal liberty, but who are clothed and fed and housed by somebody else, well, there's a word for people like that, and that word is slaves. And Piers Morgan is an example of what is left in Britain when all of the people who were willing to take a chance on freedom left, when the, when the people in Britain for the last couple of hundred years, including virtually all of our founding fathers, by the way, they simply decided they were gonna take a chance. They decided they were adult enough and, and preferred the freedom to the security, so they risked their lives, came here, started this revolution. It's kept 320 million of us now free for uh, 228 years or something like that, and I don't expect to let it end on my watch, and I know you don't either. Uh, that's the Hot Mike Show for today. I'm Bill Whittle. We'll be back on Monday. Thanks very much for joining us. We'll see you here next time right on NRA TV.